Howdy, friends. I'm Mike Rule, and this is The Mike Check, a podcast where we strengthen the church to make a stronger defense of the faith by biblically checking the unbiblical. Welcome to our very first episode. And so in this episode, I would like to set the vision and mission for this podcast But I would also like to start off a segment of why I believe, why someone would believe Christianity is true, and I'm going to take the first crack at that. That being said, let's roll. I feel like I need to say that um, this is pretty weird. I'm sitting in the Loftus, which has been very low-key transformed into a podcast recording studio, speaking into a microphone by myself into my mighty MacBook with no one else here. And so, yeah, it's strange. Um, But that being said and out of the way, I wanted to just take a few moments and set the, the vision and mission uh, for what we're trying to do here. And you heard me say a minute ago, our, our, mission slash vision statement, right? Strengthening the church to give a stronger defense of the faith by biblically checking the unbiblical. And I want to say something as well that you will probably hear me say a million times. This podcast is not a substitute for active membership in a faithful Bible preaching church, one that is grounded in historic apostolic orthodox Christianity. Right. Our opponents will say that there is no such thing as historic apostolic orthodox Christianity because it's all made up, but that's not true. That is a lie, and that is not true. Um, in short, what we mean is we believe what the Bible has always said, what the church has always believed since the time that Jesus ascended back to the Father, and the church fathers, or the apostles rather, first, and the church fathers took over, and then all the way up through today. We know that. We have that. That's been preserved for us in the Word of God. I thought about starting a podcast for a really long time, but I always hesitated because everyone and their mom and their mom's dog has a podcast, and I was like, I really don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be another podcast guy. But then a woman in our church, as we were talking about podcasts, and I kind of told her what my thought would be if I were to start a podcast, and she said, I'd listen to that. And I was like... Okay. And then I realized, well, people are listening to podcasts all the time. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, and yeah, there are so many of them, but still, I felt compelled that I needed to add a voice for the biblical truth. And there are lots of good voices out there that are speaking truth in a biblical way. So all that to say that this podcast is really for the church for the people of the church to support it again, not to replace it. Maybe I can be so bold as to say that this podcast is for Highlands Bible Church and other local churches, but Highlands Bible Church are my sheep, right? They're my people. I love them dearly. To strengthen them, to strengthen the church, which are, which is Christians, right? The church is not a building. The church is Christians. To give a stronger defense of the faith, Maybe I can be so bold as to say, yes, this is for you guys at Highlands. We're going to have lots of people from Highlands as special guests on here and, of course, others as we talk. And when we talk about defending the faith, that puts us squarely in the realm of apologetics. And maybe many of you might know what that means, but apologetics from the Greek apologia means to give a defense, to give a reasonable argument. And of course, the Apologetics Great Commission in 1 Peter 3.15 tells us that we are to first set our hearts to honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense, there's our word, apologia, to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you, yet do so with gentleness and respect. And that's what we're seeking to do here. We're seeking to give a defense of the faith. And we'll talk a little bit more about gentleness and respect in a minute. But it is way past time for all Christians to know why they believe what they believe. And the Mic Check podcast is hopefully another way to strengthen Christians to give a stronger defense of their faith. Because, guys, I'm not sure if you've noticed, but our faith is being dragged through the mud in our culture and has been for decades. It's it's just at a fever pitch right now. We are being mocked. We are being misrepresented all over the place. And we need to stand. And as author Stephen Nichols said in his really good small book, it's not time to cower, capitulate, or cave. It is rather a time 
for confidence. And so how are we going to seek to strengthen the church by giving or strengthen the church to give a stronger defense of the faith? And that's the second part, by biblically checking the unbiblical. And so what do I mean by that? The first part, of course, is biblically, meaning we use God's Word, the Bible. God's Word, the Bible, and all 66 books literally contains the Word of God. Scripture tells us, of course, in 2 Timothy 3, that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So if God breathed it out, his literal creative breath, right, that means that he is the author. And so watch this. That means that scripture is authoritative. So when he says, thus saith the Lord, we do that. When he says in 1 Peter 3, be ready to give a defense of the faith, we need to be ready to give a defense of the faith and do so with gentleness and respect. In later episodes, I'm sure we will get into questions like how we got the Bible. So I'm resisting the temptation to go down a rabbit hole here. But specifically, the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible through men. Peter, in his second letter, said that Scripture didn't come from anyone's own interpretation, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the Bible isn't like any other book on the planet. It's the only book where the author, God the Holy Spirit, is with us as we read it. So on this podcast, you will not be shocked. We will use the Bible as our standard, as the God-authored and authoritative source of truth, and we will check it against that. And that leads us to our second part. That passage in 2 Timothy that I just mentioned earlier tells us that the Bible is necessary for a few things, teaching, reproof, correction, training. In other words, sum those words up in one word, checking. We check things. We test things. Specifically, of course, in the realm of apologetics, we test ideas. We check ideas against the Word of God and see how they line up against that standard. So when I'm working around the house, which I do to limited success due to my limited mechanical ability, abilities, uh, I check measurements before I cut something with a ruler. Many times, and I usually still get it wrong. I check to see if something is level before I screw it to the wall or something using a level. And in this case, we check ideas against the standard of the Word of God. And note that I said ideas, not people, personally. That goes back to 1 Peter in that we do so with gentleness and respect. We are, we are looking and checking ideas. But sure, ideas are attached to people, so sometimes it might seem that I might be attacking a person, but we don't want to attack people personally. We're not out to disparage anyone's character. We want to check their ideas, or maybe a better word here is worldviews against the Word of God. A passage that helps us in this regard is 2 Corinthians 10.5, which tells us we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. So that's what we're after. We're after arguments and lofty opinions that that set themselves up against the truth, the knowledge of God. We aren't out to destroy people. We are out to destroy ideas. And that word for destroy in the Greek means to cause destruction by tearing down. In other words, some of you will find this very ironic. We are looking to deconstruct false worldviews by checking them against the Bible. And some of you are chuckling because deconstruction is a term that is in vogue right now. We have whole other podcasts. I was on one one time. It was kind of a disaster. We'll talk about that some other time. Dedicated to Christians deconstructing their faith. However, I would maintain that uh, most, the overwhelming majority of these people who are, quote, deconstructing their faith are not deconstructing from the true biblical gospel. They're deconstructing, quote, from a cheap, squishy, evangelical substitute. And that is what they're moving away from, not true biblical Christianity. And again, that kind of compels us once again to know the truth and know why we believe the truth. That leads us to the third part of the vision, biblically checking the un- Biblical. So yes, again, we are going to be dealing with ideas and worldviews. We are going to be dealing with current events. We are going to be getting in the weeds with hot button issues like abortion, LGBTQ. Yes, we're going to talk politics. We're going to look at anything that is unbiblical, and we are going to check that against the biblical truth. That being said, why? Why would we do that? And I think that's a good place to transition to the second part of the podcast today. Pause for drink of my tea. Wet my whistle. 
this segment, um, I'm calling for now why I believe, the idea here is not a personal testimony. You know, we just had Baptism Sunday here at Highlands Bible Church this past Sunday, and it was absolutely amazing. And we had 10 people stand in the pool and give their personal testimony of how God converted them. The Why I Believe segment includes that, but it's not limited to that. If someone were to ask you, if you're a Christian, why are you a Christian? That's different than your personal testimony. And how would you answer that question? And so I'm looking to have people from Highlands Bible Church and elsewhere answer that question. Why do you believe? Why do you believe Christianity is true? And to kick things off, I'm going to start with me, right? Hey, I'm the one who came up with this idea, so I guess I get to go first. Why do I believe? Why do I have Christianity is true? And here's what I would say. I believe Christianity is true because I believe the evidence. Christianity is not, and this is where we've got to distance ourselves from squishy, evangelical, mainstream, non-denominational Christianity. It is not a private, emotional, feel-good relation, or religion, sorry. See, I almost fell right into the trap there with, it's a relationship. Well, yes, but it's based on evidence. It's based on facts. The Bible contains facts, and if there are some of my atheist friends listening to this right now, they're rolling their eyes and cussing and throwing things or throwing their iPhone. But the short answer really is to the question why I believe is because I believe the testimony of the eyewitnesses. I believe the eyewitness evidence. <clears throat> now, what kind of evidence do we see? Well, for me personally, and this is where this is going to resonate differently with different people, why I believe Christianity is true, right? Generally, you're going to have external evidence and internal evidence, right? I'm going to give you two external evidences and one internal evidence. The first evidence that I believe is I believe in what's called the design argument. In other words, according to Romans 1, right, God has revealed himself in what has been made. God has revealed himself in creation. And so literally, all you have to know, all you have to see in order to know that God exists is to walk outside. And you see the earth, and you see creation, and you see complexity. And you realize that it's too beautiful, too powerful, too complex to not have a designer. That's simply what the design argument says, that every single thing is designed, and so therefore things have a designer. The earth was obviously designed, so therefore it has a designer. I'm sitting in a chair right now that was designed by some guy in a cubicle, right? The same thing, talking into a microphone and a MacBook, right? All of these things were designed by designers. There's no such thing as something that wasn't designed, right? Even you and I. We're designed, Scripture tells us, created in our Creator's image. And, you know, some people will say, well, of course, that's science and all of that, and we're certainly going to get into science and the cult of scientism. But science just points back to God. Science is just theories of what God's creation is and how it works. And so I think with just as much fervor as others might say to me, um, you know, there's not enough evidence— of a creator, uh, I just see the opposite. There's so much evidence of a creator. To me, it's foolish for thinking that all of this earth just happened through time, billions of years, and chance, random chance acting on matter. Where else does that work that creates such a complexity of this world? As someone else said, it's the absolute absurdity of believing the alternative. What's the alternative? If there's not a God, then this all just fell together perfectly? There's no way. I can't accept that. So that's the first bit of evidence of what I believe is the design argument. The second bit of external evidence that I believe that compels me personally is the moral argument. Similar to the design argument, right? There is a code of morality, everywhere in the world. There is a moral law, so therefore there must be a moral law giver, right? And of course, the opponents would say, well, that's all cultural. And maybe to an extent, right, there's cultural variations within morality. I'll give you that. But go anywhere in the world and randomly attack and brutally beat someone to death. 
is there anybody that's not going to call that wrong? And where does that come from? That comes from someone else with a standard like our God and King, and that is God's law. And he has written that on our hearts. And so we all have a sense of right and wrong, no matter where we are, no matter what culture we are, because we are created in the image of God. The, the problem with the atheistic worldview, right, is that no one can actually live like an atheist in a consistent way. If they were walking down a, a dark alley at midnight and they got hit over the head and mugged, right, they would want justice. But right then and there, they've stepped over the line into the biblical worldview because justice is a biblical concept. It is not an atheist materialistic concept. If we're just all bags of mostly water and carbon floating around on a space rock bumping into each other, oh, well, another rock bumped into somebody else. What can, they, what can you do about that? Nothing. But if you want to call it something wrong, then now you're in the biblical worldview because God is the one who decides right and wrong. And so the moral argument is really the second compelling reason for me of why I believe what I believe. Each one of us has a sense of right and wrong within us. We see something. If we see something um, unjust or immoral, we have a visceral reaction to it. All of us do. That was put there by our Creator, and it's one of the other things along with uh, the design argument that is put there that should compel us to pursue Him. And that's kind of the third thing for me when we talk about that. We, we, we talk about, well, I talk about the design argument, the moral argument, but thirdly, I talk about the internal evidence. And this is where a lot of Christians tend to camp out, but this is where the realm of the personal testimony is. But I can sum it up, the internal evidence, by this. I believe in God because I believe of the transformative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is something that I get to see day in, day out here at Highlands Bible Church. Again, just saw it on Sunday. Saw 10 people stand in that pool and tell about how the gospel has transformed them, not how they are trying to live their best life, not how they are trying to white knuckle and do the best job that they can, not how they're trying to be a good person, right? No, how the old sinful self is dead and how the new self is alive. And that was beautifully represented by baptism. Here at Highlands Bible Church, we are credo-baptistic by conviction. I have a lot of respect for my uh, reformed, uh, covenantal, paedo-baptistic brothers and sisters. Uh, but here we are straight up credo, adult believer baptism, where we uh, take the scriptures to mean that you have understood the gospel, you have repented, and you've placed your faith in Jesus, and therefore you are united with Christ by faith. And that union with Christ has many, many blessings, but one of the biggest blessings that it has is that you are united to Christ in his death when he died to sin. Through faith now, you died to sin. You're dead. That old sinful self is dead. It's gone. And when you come up out of the water in baptism, you are washed, you are regenerated, as Titus 3.5 tells us, and you are raised to new life. Just as Christ walked out of the tomb to new life, therefore we become new people. And so becoming a Christian doesn't mean that we are just trying to be nice, that we're trying to be better. Becoming a Christian means that we are new, that we have been made new. The old is gone, the new has come. And so that is the transformative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I get to see that every day here at Highlands Bible Church. Well, not every day, but Many times at Highlands Bible Church, as people hear the Word of God, they repent, they believe, and they come to faith. But also, guys, I've seen it in my own personal life. Like, 30 years ago, I was not a Christian. I had the privilege of being raised in a Christian home, which I'll get to in a minute, but I was not a Christian. I was not practicing a Christian. Um, I was drowning in my own sin, as one of our uh, baptizees uh, summarized quite powerfully on Sunday. I was drowning in my own sin and selfishness, pushing down kind of inner demons with a lot of substance abuse, and I was a musician, and so I was traveling up uh, up and down New Jersey in the clubs and, and drinking about all of the meager money that I would make, 
And I, I realized that I just kept spiraling down and down into immorality. And, and I, I kind of realized that one day it was going to kill me. That still didn't compel me. Um, but when uh, we were pregnant with our first child, right, that kind of made me think maybe I should get off the road and maybe I should actually get a real job. I was fortunate enough to have a college degree. Thank you, Mom and Dad. And so uh, that's what I thought I would do. I would get a real job. And so I did that, um, and I kind of just started down the path of what we were supposed to do as Americans, right? I got the job in corporate America. I got the cubicle. I wore the khaki pants and the polo shirts and had the ID badge hanging from the belt, you know, and I bought a house, and, you know, we settled down, and it just still felt empty. Those, those, those still kind of nagging uh, questions of my soul, right, were, were not being answered. And then one of the big milestone events happened, which was September 11th, uh, 2021. In my office, I'm looking at a, a picture given to me by, by my good friend Piero, which was taken two days uh, before September 11th. And seeing those towers, you know, I grew up a Bergen County kid, so I saw those towers all the time. We would go up in those towers on field trips and other things. And, you know, you would think if anything was permanent in this world, it would be something like the Twin Towers. And that day when they came crashing down and in total between the three sites, right, 3,000 people lost their lives. They never expected to lose their lives that day. To them, it was an ordinary Tuesday. God used the events of that day, the tragedy of that day, to shake me out of my selfishness. And in the, the energy that I was running away from him, I now ran towards him. God made me realize that everything in this world is temporary and that there's one thing that's permanent and eternal, and that's him. And I was so thankful that my parents brought me up in the church. Uh, we can talk another day if that was a, a, if I heard the gospel correctly or not or whatever. It was the, the 80s, so it was definitely a squishy, light and fluffy time for the gospel back then. I don't know. I don't remember. But I do remember that because I was brought up in the church, I knew where to go. And so I turned and I ran towards God with all the energy that I was running away from God. And at that time, podcasts had just kind of hit the scene. The Young, Restless, and Reformed uh, movement had just started, so there were lots of guys and lots of podcasts. I had a monster commute to work, so I'd be listening to whole conferences worth of episodes of teaching uh, by guys like Piper and MacArthur and Mahaney and uh, just Kevin DeYoung and just crazy amounts of intake of sermons, and it just started to shape me because I heard God's Word being preached in context expositionally. There was another person that started a church locally who preached through the Gospel of John, and I remember thinking, well, that's weird. Like, sermons are supposed to be like, you know, five ways of how to have a happier Monday, a joke and a story and a poem, and you're done. No, he marched through the Gospel of John, and I just remembered being transformative that the Holy Spirit used that. So I don't really have a moment where God um, said to me and saved me and then I was a Christian. It just seems like a seesaw where it was just kind of like more truth, more truth, more truth. And then suddenly it just, I realized I was a Christian. I realized that I believe this. We started attending a local church and at that time it was Green Pond Bible Chapel. And uh, we actually started before uh, if you check the, the record books, I think we started in 2000, but then definitely started regularly after uh, 9-11 and started a discipleship relationship with the pastor there, got to know people, started serving in ministry, became members, got baptized, plugged into the local church. And so that, again, brings us back to the importance and the criticality of membership and serving commitment to a local church and then just kept growing and gradually got called into ministry. And, and, and my wife and I, um, as we were dealing with a lot of things, we had attended a biblical counseling conference, and a lot of things came up that we had to deal with in our own marriage. And, and, and that was difficult. And we realized, though, that if the gospel is true, right, it's not about just trying to be better people. Again, the gospel is about new people. And so if the gospel's true, if we really are new people, then we're in. And we're in with this marriage, and we are in with ministry, and we both felt a compelling sense that we, need to, we needed to serve God, and we wanted a front row seat to watch God transform people through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so why do I believe the third part is 
I believe, the internal evidence of the fact that God transforms power, people, transforms people through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've seen it many times here at Highlands, and I've seen it in my own life. So why do I believe? I believe this world was designed by a designer. I believe we all have a sense of morality that was given to us by the moral lawgiver himself, the author and creator of his law and perfection. And I believe in the transformative power of the gospel that I see here and I see in my own life as well. So that's my stab at answering why I believe the gospel is true. Well, we have accomplished the mission that we've set out for today. We have introduced uh, the mission and vision of the Mike Check podcast, and I was the first to go in the Why I Believe segment. And so I hope that you found this helpful. I hope that you will continue to listen. Again, the goal is that we are going to have um, a mix of you know me talking, but not just me talking every day. Definitely want to have some guests on the podcast and answer questions. We're going to continue down the why path. Um, next time when we get together, we're going to be answering the question with a special guest of why Christian education. What's so special about Christian education? Why should parents con- consider Christian education in this day and age? And we'll continue with lots of other topics and lots of other guests. If you have ideas of topics or feedback or whatever else, brownie recipes, shoot me an email at mike at the mic check podcast.com. That's mike at the mic check podcast.com. You can also go to the website at themikecheckpodcast.com, which is not up yet, but will be soon. Working on that. But uh, that is all the time we have for today. So thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you next time on The Mic Check.